for joining us on this conversation around uh, blended finance approaches to generating environmental and social impact during the Ancal Global Forum. I am Ana Rabinha and I work for ISF Advisors. We are an organization focused on research and strategic and financial advisory around access to finance for smallholder farmers and rural SMEs. While most of the team is in the US, we also have a presence in Europe, East Africa, and Australia. And I'm joining from, uh, from Spain, from Santiago de Compostela, which is a city in the Northwest, Northwest part of the country. So while we wait for more folks to join, um, I was thinking, can I have the people already on the line to share where they are and what organizations are you working for or the roles that you have? So say if you're an entrepreneur or you're an investor or an advisor, um, I just think this color would help me and, and the speakers um, understand a little bit better the audience today. So um, while you shared that with us, um, I will start off by thanking you all at home for the patience and determination that takes us to a conference fully online like this. Um, and I will thank as well in Telecap uh, for organizing, organizing the forum and ensuring that our industry continues to have a space to hold these uh, relevant debates and and give us a space as well to interact among us. We have um, here on the line um, a few members of Intelecap, Margaret, Rachel, and Alan, supporting the session. And I would like to thank them and acknowledge them from um, the outset. So um, now let's talk the best for technology. Um, ISF joined uh, the Africa Forum in Nairobi last year. Well, not last year, back in February, but um, it feels a totally different world. And we were really impressed by the convening power um, and the energy, both during the sessions and outside the session. So when um, we found out that Intellicap was holding the Global Forum um, online this year, we wanted to be a, a party to these conversations. And, and we thought it was the ideal uh, convening space to have the, the conversation that we're gonna have today. So let me perhaps um, give you a bit of context on how we arrived here and why we think talking about blended finance approaches to generate social, environmental, and financial return is, uh, is, is urgent uh, within our community. From a recent project, we realized that uh, there is a lot of interest in the impact capital space to better understand this space. Um, back in May, ISF embarked on an exercise to better understand um, this blended finance, um, the blended finance funds supporting tropical forest areas and communities that are working towards generating uh, this triple bottom line. And the work uh, was generously supported by the Parker Foundation and culminated with a, a publication in July. And we were not expecting that this publication will generate so much interest. The reality is that it sparked a lot of engagement with fund managers and uh, public actors. And it's also one of our most popular pieces of research, generating a lot of traffic online and on downloads. So very quickly, under we understood that this is, um, that this is um, one um, an area that our community has a lot of uh, interest in, but where there is a lot of there are a lot of um, still question marks around how we can achieve this triple bottom line. Um, so today we're gonna um, explore blended finance approaches um, more, and particularly the challenges that still remain. Fund managers uh, have been able to mobilize capital. And we have seen um, an increase in sophistication around the space as reflected by the myriad of, um, of uh, blended finance approaches to structuring capital and also the number of unique investment strategies. During this session, we're, we would like to explore these approaches a little bit more. 
we also found that despite the ability to mobilize capital, fund managers still face challenges when it comes to deploy those monies effectively. Um, and, and finally, uh, when, when discussing um, in this la landscape exercise with different actors, they consistently mention the fact that it was, you know, hard to, to scale impact and uh, there was a still um, the, um, a lack uh, on, on a shared knowledge around how effect, how, or which are the most effective business model attaining this impact. So these are areas that we will also like to touch upon today. I'm gonna um, give you a quick overview of the session uh, and we'll shortly introduce the speakers. So um, after this introduction and a little context, I will give the floor to our three speakers today. Uh, I will be framing um, you know, very broadly the area that I would like them to touch upon. And then I will give each of them 10 minutes to elaborate on this. Um, Today we have um, Boris uh, Spassky, who is an investment director at Miroba, uh, working on the land degradation neutrality fund. We have uh, Ninke Sam, who is the program director at Landscape Finance in IDH. And we have Lenny Martinez, who is the head of sustainability at 123. Um, so after this very brief introduction, uh, the speakers we have more time to, you know, introduce themselves and the role within their uh, organization. I'm gonna uh, give the floor to to Boris. And Boris, perhaps uh, we can start the discussion um, around, you know, blended finance as a way to generate combined and environmental uh, social returns. And we would like to hear from you interview um, the main trends and characteristics um, in the blended finance space and sustainable land use. So can you talk about you know, where are we coming from and where are we going? And um, you know, given your role as investment director in Europa working with the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund, are you close both to the investor space and actual patent development and, and capital deployment? So perhaps you could share your perspectives around these two very different realities. Um, and finally, if you have time, you can share with us one investment that is made, one or you know innovative uh, approach that you've recently supported. Think that will help um, kind of evidence the type of project or your company that um, your fund would be supporting and would be generating this uh, triple bottom line that I was talking about before. So over to you now, Boris. Thank you very much. So yeah, my name is Boris. I'm the investment director with the Aldian Fund um, in charge of investments, especially in Latin America. So basically four years ago, following a tender process, Mirova won a tender um, from the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And well, this gave them the right to work on the structure uh, and launch a manager fund that would combat land degradation. So it launched in December 2018. It has 150 assets on 150 million assets under management and has committed over 60 million. So you've got both public investors and private investors into this fund. It's a tranche structure. So very quickly on the fund, four ideas. It's a fund which is aligned with SDG 15.3, so land degradation neutrality. Uh, so land degradation. Basically, it's the fact that we are degrading 12 million hectares a year and we don't have enough quality. I mean, we don't have enough quantity of land and quality to support ecosystem services. So the trend has to be stopped. So second idea, it's, it's, it's a mission driven fund. Uh, impact first, um, we, we screened the um, ESG impacts before we actually spent time on assessing the financials and the, the robustness. So this is it. Uh, three, it's a fund dedicated to value creation, uh, leverage, leveraging on two drivers. Basically, it's the availability of solutions. You've got landscape approaches, you've got good agricultural practices, and today, the growing demand for sustainable goods. Fourth idea, it's a transitioning fund with the public sector catalyzing private investors into sustainable land use through a blended finance structure. 
So the mission is to mobilize further private financing to agricultural and forestry projects that contribute to mitigating climate change. So because we are in the business of financing innovative uh, projects, uh, it's not easy. We choose to go to the moon because it's hard. That's what Kennedy said. And it's the same with if you want to do sustainable management, sustainable land management with strong ESG impacts and returns, you're in for a pretty innovative and difficult uh, investment. So we have a technical assistance facility, which I think is key, uh, which is run by IDH, represented here by Ninka Stam. So, and it's quite hands-on. We travel on site together and we, we assess projects. There is both a pre-investment component and post-investment component. So to get back to blended finance, why I would like to make the case for it, why is it indispensable? is that you have to discuss investors' current appetite because we're in here our small close-knit circle of people who are passionate about sustainable land management, but it's not the case all over the world. So, uh, and money is not flowing as it should. So if you ask a private institutional investor today who's managing pensioners' money in Europe or the US, if he, she's interested in non-listed assets versus listed, company stocks or bonds, few of them have this appetite, huh? It's easier when you can unwind your position on a computer in the evening saying, I don't like this stock, I'm selling it back. Um, ask them if they're interested in primary agriculture. Very few are because it's seen as risky. Uh, if they are, they will seek to invest in farms in New Zealand or the US, owning the land to secure the investment. Um, if you then ask about investing in non-listed assets, there's a liquidity risk. You might not be able to sell when you wish to exit. Non-listed assets in the agricultural space, in emerging markets, well, mainstream investors, they're all gone. Basically, this is the reality. They won't do it much. Huh? It's changing, of course. And uh, we've got Lenny here who will say that it does exist with pension funds. So today, investing in uh, Google or Apple stocks, uh, in the FANG, GAFA, whatever you call them, seems more attractive. And if you look at the market capitalization of uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, you are roughly... Well, it was, it was last year, but you, you're, you're over 3,000 billion US dollars. So the perception on sustainable land management has to change and we need to attract more people. This is on yeah, classic investors' appetite. Then uh, if, if we discuss the, the financing needs, uh, they're, they're tremendous and public money is a scarce resource. This was the hardest bit to secure for the LDN fund. Huh? So annual funding gap to reach the SDGs, uh, the 17 SDGs by 2030 is estimated at $2.5 trillion, according to the World Bank. So we've only got 160 billion US dollars of official development finance flowing on average every year to develop um, to developing countries. It's 6% of the resources needed. And the world needs to pour billions into agriculture to achieve SDG 15.3, but most important, I would say even SDG 2. I mean, zero hunger. So we need to produce more, more sustainably in order to reach food security locally. And if you take, well, one example, it's, uh, it's Africa. In Africa alone, which imports 35 billion US dollars worth of food every year, 40 billion US dollars are needed every year to finance the, to, to bridge the gap. So if no action is taken, uh, Africa will import 110 billion US dollars worth of food every year by 2025. So, and today Nigeria is the world's largest rice importer. So the, here you go. And it, looking at the numbers, the numbers is quite alarming. 65% of the population is rural, 25 to 30% of GDP comes directly from agriculture. And in African banks portfolio, agriculture weighs less than 5%. So here there's, uh, there's an issue you need to tackle urgently. Could the public sector finance agriculture? Mm -hmm. Not so easy. In Africa, on average, governments collect 20 to 25 percent of GDP in taxes, much lower than in OECD countries, while Europe yeah, collects 40 percent of GDP. Uh, so their ability to finance a transition to sustainable land management uh, is limited. And last year, the African Development Bank invested one billion into African ag. So I think ODN donors was three billion, governments three billion and commercial lending reached one billion. So it's not enough. And think of if BlackRock, which has got 6,000 billion uh, yeah, assets on the margin, would just divert some of their assets, there you go, you have it. 
So the, the African Development Bank, for example, now it's changing its strategies, calling for a Marshall Plan for African Ag, uh, and it's trying to mobilize private sector uh, through various instruments, such as guarantees, de-risking facilities, junior investments into funds. So my third point is that blended finance is one of the solutions, because the private sector has to step in to finance sustainable land use. It is our role to demonstrate that there are economically viable projects in emerging markets and that there are alternatives to the classic large scale uh, ag model, which uses agrochemicals uh, intensively. So the LDN funds, uh, one, two, three, are uh, other funds or entities, what IDH does, these are all uh, good examples of blended finance models. Um, apart from reaching a first closing, yeah, we have deployed the uh, funds in various projects. Uh, we've got a project in Peru, one in uh, Bhutan, one in Nicaragua. And so I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good transition for Ninke to step in and uh, explain what um, IDH does on the ground because I think it's the most interesting bit. There you go. The floor is yours, Ninke. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. No, this is uh, it's fantastic. Um, you very well made the case, you know, for Blended Finance as a much needed tool to bridge this uh, impact, uh, this sorry, investment gap on agriculture and sustainable land use. Um, so I will turn over now to Ninke to provide us this uh, complementary perspective, given that you work alongside Boris on the LDNF and, and alongside other fund managers as well. So I think I'm gonna ask you to you know, give an overview of your work uh, at IDH as technical assistance partner to this um, investment manager. Put you first on the screen. <laughs> um, and also as a knowledge uh, hub for the industry. Um, and then I'd like you to touch upon you know, specific um, topics around the technical dimension of uh, project design. Um, I think it would be, you know, interest, interesting for the audience to hear um, whether you would experience any tension in when project developers aim to maximize these three dimensions. Uh, given that I, I think it's widely under, it's widely believed, no, that uh, there is indeed a trade-off between the maximization of environmental or social or financial returns. So it would be super interesting to, to hear your perspective around that. Um, and where are the best models as well, to, as well to kind of accomplish this impact in this period I mentioned. So I'm gonna stop here and over to you, Nike. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, before I kick off, um, I see the presentation very small on my screen. Would it be possible to put it on, uh, on widescreen? Because I've, I've got quite some details in it in those slides, so uh, they'd be quite small for people to look at uh, this way. And while you're uh, while you're organizing for that, um, maybe helpful to introduce myself. So my name is Nienke Stam. I'm uh, a program director with IDH, overlooking our uh, our landscape finance portfolio. And IDH is uh, yeah. Thanks very much. That's better. Um, IDH is uh, an organization, we call ourselves a public-private partnership platform. So we really bring together uh, private sector and public sector for uh, our global goals. So SDGs and also, of course, the, uh, the Paris agenda. Uh, and our main impact teams, and we made those very flat, very easy, <laughs> better jobs, better incomes, and better environments. So exactly connecting those, uh, those uh, points that uh, Anna mentioned. And if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> maybe helpful to provide a bit of context on why we are actually talking about sustainable land use investments today. Um, could you move to the next slide, Anna? Thanks. So sustainable land management investments. Uh, Boris just explained this space that LDN Fund is operating in, but why is this actually so relevant? I just want to put this on the screen. We have a, a double agenda here. There's of course the global agenda where IPCC highlights that 23% of all the anthropogenic, so human created greenhouse gas emissions are related to, uh, to land use change. And also there's an alarming report from WRI that says that if we continue to consume the way we do, 
our food, uh, in 2050, this will have doubled. So the impact of land use change on climate will have become much more impactful. Um, so there is a strong convergence of views that investment is needed in a transition um, in new production systems combined with other consumption systems to, to make sure that we safeguard our planet, right? But also sustainable land use. Uh, so that, that investment agenda is out there. We need to invest in innovative ways of using our land, uh, agroforestry, regenerative agriculture, nature-based solutions, making sure that ecosystem services are secured in the long run is important for, uh, for combating climate change and for maintaining a healthy planet. But that's not the only thing. Uh, there is also, of course, a strong local agenda. And that local agenda is that also people live on land and, uh, and they need land for, for their food security, uh, for, for production, for being able to maintain healthy, uh, and also local, uh, yeah, local ecosystem services, clean water, clean air. So investment in, uh, in sustainable land management has global impacts and also local impacts that enable healthy livelihoods. So I, I just make, put that message out there. Also, as, as Anna referred to this point, is there tension between these agendas? Uh, I don't see that tension. I see a global convergence towards a combined agenda where it is recognized that investment in sustainable land management is needed to sustain livelihoods. It's an inclusive agenda. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, just to highlight uh, the role of IDH in this space uh, currently. Uh, of course, we work in a number of global supply chains where we promote better jobs, better incomes, um, better environment, but we also have a, quite a focused agenda on, on mobilizing investment. Uh, and there we are currently managing an investment fund, the FarmFit Fund, uh, and we have partnerships with a number of very strategically positioned sustainable land management funds for which we then manage the technical assistance facilities. So this includes the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund, uh, represented on this, uh, on this webinar by Boris. Uh, it also includes Agri3 Fund, a new investment vehicle uh, co-managed by Mirova as well. And, and Green Fund, also an investment vehicle that's, that's quite innovative, investing in sustainable land management and protection of natural resources. Now, moving on to the next slide, uh, what do we do as a technical assistance facility? So our TA facility services, they work, and you can see that here on the outcomes box, on, on three different goals mainly. We support investment readiness of projects so that uh, a portfolio of impactful sustainable land management initiatives is available to those investors that want to step into this space. And developing those projects actually takes, takes effort. Um, and if you look at the actions list here, it gives you a bit of an impression of the type of activities um, that we support as a technical assistance facility with the, say, 20, 25 projects we currently have under management. A number of activities focus very much on strengthening operational and financial structures of an investment. So those are often initiatives uh, that have grown on the ground locally, but that need to be aggregated or that need to be structured in a certain way to make them bankable. Um, we work on uh, and support on ESG compliance. That's often with projects that are a bit closer to becoming investment ready, uh, but still have a couple of specific hurdles to be overcome. Uh, this could be related to, to FPIC. It could also be related to capacity building on social and environmental management. Uh, and is sometimes related to, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and then you see two actions uh, around inclusion and protection and restoration. What we do as a TA facility is that we try to maximize the social and environmental impact of these investment funds. So under the inclusion pillar of work, uh, what we do is support, for example, the design of outgrower schemes, um, but also, for example, um, the development of specific training packages to empower women leaders within an organization, within farmer cooperatives, uh, or uh, look specifically, and I think I mentioned that one before, at land rights situations. So how can an investment actually support and strengthen land rights of, uh, of local communities? 
Also, uh, we maximize social and environmental impacts by supporting investee projects in protection and restoration agenda. And that is often by supporting them to develop a, a landscape lens. So instead of only focusing on their on-farm impacts, they can partner with organizations neighboring them, their communities, the government, uh, other landowners, and together develop a joint vision on how to manage ecosystem services, uh, land, water, biodiversity within that wider landscape. Because that landscape is often of vital importance to the companies themselves as well. They need water resources, they need trees for, uh, for the microclimate, for rainfall, uh, and also uh, they want to demonstrate that they are a company that is uh, socially and environmentally responsible. Um, so that is the second outcome, maximizing social and environmental impacts. And then finally, of course, as a TA facility, we have a role on sharing lessons learned. So we really want to support building of a new sustainable land management asset class. And that, and to grow that space, it helps to unpack what these investment opportunities look like so that others can learn from that, build on it and help scale it. And also what we try to do is really support a data-based approach uh, by supporting projects to lay a solid social and environmental impact baseline so that five, 10, 15 years from now, it can solidly be demonstrated what the impact of this investment project has been. So that besides, uh, of course, healthy financial performance, also the social and environmental impact performance can be strongly demonstrated hoping that that will also then help scale up accountability in this asset class and, uh, and crowd in additional investment. So that, uh, that very quickly, or maybe not so quickly, but uh, as quick as I could about our, uh, our technical assistance facility work. And, uh, and I think our partnership with LDN Fund is a very good example of that. Um, if we move on to the next slide, mm -hmm. then, um, this is a publication that I would like to highlight that already includes a number of these very specific case studies that uh, that Boris was just referring to. So the technical assistance facility has um, in its portfolio uh, currently uh, a certain number of, of projects. And annually, we have a publication where we select a number of case studies. So what you see on the screen here is the link to the 2019 case study publication. And in those case studies, we summarize the, the landscape context and the land rights situation in which this sustainable land management investment project is operating. Uh, we feature the financing model. So how was this investment structured? We feature the business model, both for the operator and for the farmer slash community where that is uh, applicable. Uh, we quickly summarize the technical assistance support to the project and, uh, and the main impact KPIs and where possible progress on, on those. So um, interesting series of, uh, of publications. And if you move to the next slide, Anna, then I'll also start uh, wrapping up. Uh, our next publication uh, is the LDN Technical Assistance Facility Learning Brief for uh, 2020. And that one will be coming out December 2020, but likely January 2021. Uh, and it will feature uh, uh, updates on the existing LDN TAF portfolio and three new deep dives into, uh, into uh, case studies, uh, into existing investees of, of the LDN fund. So as a heads up, uh, stay tuned for these publications. And if of interest, uh, already visit our, our website to, uh, to look at the 2019 publication. And uh, with that, I'd like to, to wrap up and uh, hand back over to Anna. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nike. We look forward to, to seeing that report coming out. Uh, we'll stay tuned 100%. Uh, and thank you for complementing, you know, Boris' perspective with uh, the, technical, the technical part. I, I think that in this blended finance community, very often, we we just uh, we just don't spend enough time understanding uh, the technical approach and and understanding the potential for this as you mentioned for this uh, for this component to be something that catalyzes additional additional capital and mobilizes additional capital by you know turning these projects um or making these projects investable so thank you so much for 
going over over these dimensions. So now I would like to give the floor to to Lenny, to the third speaker. Um, and I think your you know your perspective will further complement this, given that you know you're uh, the sustainability manager at One Two Three, which is a German pension fund and agroforestry uh, pr a project implementer. Uh, and you work um, with the projects on the ground, creating that impact and measuring that impact. So, um, Lenny, I would love <laughs> if you could give you know the audience today a bit of an overview of what your role um, looks like, the activity of One Two Three, and then you know we've been talking about the impact for a little while now this morning, big buzzwords. But you know what uh, does impact uh, look like for you? Um, and how do you define it internally at um, one, two, three? Um, and then I would like you to explore the impact question, uh, impact question at two levels. So at the fund level, um, how are you balancing these three dimensions? And also at the industry level, um, what are the main gaps no, that are hindering uh, in fund managers and um, this, you know, blended investment vehicles to deliver uh, optimally this, uh, you know, developmental impact. So over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. I will try to answer your questions. So my name is Denis Martinez. I'm French and Spanish, but I'm based in, in Germany, in Berlin, at the 123 headquarters. So I've been working for 123 in the last three years um, as a sustainability manager. So I developed the ESD framework, framework of, of 123 and also our KPIs indicators framework. So I will introduce uh, uh, one, two, three, and I will also present you our KPI, KPI framework and uh, the challenge uh, we currently face, uh, not only us, but also the, I think the, the world industry. Next slide, please. So basically what I wanted to say right now is um, for me, sustainability is not like a, a department, um, it's um, it should be like integrated into every department of the company. And so for me, it's a big teamwork. When we manage a farm, we manage the farm ourselves like together. And it's not like a, a separate department. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, yes, what, what I wanted to talk to you is um, introduce you one to three and also mention the KPI framework we have been developing. Next slide. So one to three is a pretty young company. So we started the company about three years ago. We got an investment mandate from a big uh, pension fund, a German pension fund based in Berlin. So we got uh, 200 million to invest into uh, agroforestry, forestry and agricultural projects. So far, we have invested into uh, seven, into uh, 12 projects in seven countries. Most of the projects are cocoa farms. Uh, some of them are already productive. So we are currently selling the cocoa production to different uh, chocolate buyers uh, in, in Europe, but also in the US. And we also invest into greenfield projects. So project where we to start from scratch and the, the farm, the plantation. So basically right now we manage around 20,000 hectares. Um, um, from these 20,000 hectares, we have almost 30% uh, conservation forest. And we work with about uh, 2,000, um, uh, we have about 2,000 employees at, at, at one, two, three. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you on, on the next slides an overview of, of the farms we have invested in. Um, as you can see, we are present in different countries and we also have um, two headquarters, one in Colombia in Medellin and one in Panama City. Um, and there, most of my colleagues are forestry experts or agronomists and they are responsible to manage um, every farm. So, but every farm is all company. So for example, Rio Lindo in Ecuador, which is a big cocoa farm, we have a team, it's a, it's a company, and, and, the, and the, my colleagues, project managers in, in Medellin and Panama, they supervise uh, these projects. I didn't mention here in this map um, a project we, we, we also have in Morocco, which is a dead, date organic plantation. It's a, it's a greenfield project, so we are not productive right now, 
but it's a very nice uh, uh, project in, in the desert in, in Tafilalet in Morocco. What I wanted to mention here is we, the idea behind all these farms, we, these farms are connected with each other. So we want to develop kind of a network where every farm learn from each other. So, um, as I said before, most of our farms are cocoa farms. So we see a big um, interest and, and need to, to exchange uh, knowledge in post-harvest uh, systems, in fertigation systems. So that is to really put together the different teams and, 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 and exchange ideas and, and, new, and new concepts. Next slide. Maybe like, uh, yes, these slides uh, is kind of uh, the ideal farm of one to three. Uh, we want to support regenerative agroforestry farms. So for, for us, it's very important to invest into multi-crops farms, or at least try to um, change when we invest into established plantations, change uh, the, the way we farm the, the, the plantation. So here is kind of um, the ideal farm we want to achieve. Uh, agroforestry systems, but also with um, conservation forest uh, for the biodiversity. And here, what I want to highlight in this slide is uh, the importance of soil, because as you know, agroforestry is a kind of a trendy concept right now. But for me, agroforestry is first of all, uh, try to understand, to, to, to understand the soil, to plant the right species. Next slide, please. Here, um, so one to three invest into into plantations. So, as you as you can see before, we have um, invest into large scale farms. But our idea is to connect with the surrounding communities, and this is particularly important to me. And I'm currently starting different pilot programs um, in different countries. One of them is in Guatemala with cardamom and cocoa producers. So basically, the idea is to connect with the farmers around the farm and um, try to set up an appropriate uh, outgrower systems. We don't have one I big idea. First of all, what we, uh, we do, we, uh, we want to understand the context, uh, the, the challenge of these producers and, and develop the appropriate um, uh, small farmer program. And we do that with, uh, with partners. So the, we have partnered with HIFER in Guatemala to manage this uh, small farmer program in, in Guatemala. Next slide, please. Here, what I want to highlight is uh, the work of the sustainability team. So we, we, in our investment processes, we have, we, we, we have different steps. Um, as um, Nick mentioned before, uh, most of this work we do ourselves, but we also work with independent auditor. Uh, what I wanted to highlight here is um, the first step is to do like a kind of a red flag or pre-DD screening, ESG screening, so where we uh, try to, um, um, see the, the, the risk, the, the, the impact, impact risk we could face, the social and environmental risks. And uh, can see my, the, the slide anymore. But yeah, so, so the, the second step after yeah. this uh, ESG uh, pre-DD screening, uh, we, we do a, a, DD, a concrete DD screening where sometimes we involve external partners to help us to identify some risks. And after, invest, after we invest into the project, we do kind of an internal baseline where we, we call it ESG, ESG ID card, where we highlight the challenge, but also the objective we want to achieve, the non-commercial objectives. So it's kind of a, a very quick overview of, of the farms and where we want to go. So to really uh, set targets. And at the same time, we have a kind of a, one to three checklist ESG standards um, based we, we 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 do we did this uh, based on on the IFC World Bank um, uh, indicators and, and criteria, and for each we for each farm we have this um, uh, this checklist um, where we at the end have a score, and we can see where we are uh, just after the acquisition, and we can. Uh, track progress uh, um, all the time. After that, for for us, it's it's very important to um, have like a ESG contract with the farm operator or with ourselves because we manage also 
most of the farms, but we have like kind of a contract where the farm manager is, is uh, responsible to achieve a, a certain productivity. But for us, it's also very important to um, to to like to have the very strict ESG st standards. So we we put this on the contract, and I think it's very important, uh, not only for us but for the industry, to have a contract where the farm operator can really uh, be evaluate not only on the productivity, but also on the, on the compliance with the ESG uh, standards. And just after acquisition, we also ask an independent auditor, which is a French uh, social company, and they evaluate the, imp the social impact of the farm and uh, do some recommendations. So we can, um, we, based on this recommendation, we implement uh, the activities on the field. And based also on the, on the, on the score of the checklist, we do kind of an ESG development plan where we um, set targets and, and set also activities um, for the next year. Anna, I can't see the presentation anymore. So I'm having a, a, a bit of trouble with uh, the presentation. It stopped working. If you okay. wish, uh, given that you're a co host, perhaps you can share your screen. So I yes. didn't want to inter interrupt you. Yes, hmm. okay. Just give me. Uh, so, um, can you see my screen right now? Okay, super. Sorry. Fantastic. So now I wanted to, to present our uh, indicators framework. So we have in, we have developed uh, about 100 indicators to measure the impact of the farms and to have a very precise and holistic vision of how we farms um, the projects. So we 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 have also for each SDGs we have selected we we have selected eight SDGs and for each of these SDGs we have kind of indicators to define um, the, the SDGs. So this is our main topics uh, that are important for us in terms of environmental and social components. Uh, so resource efficiency, climate adaptation and mitigation, protecting and enriching biodiversity, safe and qualified jobs, local interaction inclusion and good working conditions. For each of these topics, we have um, indicators. Um, as I said, we have a very large um, we have about 100 indicators for where we have data for each farm. I just wanted to mention how we came up with um, these indicators. So we, we have a set of core commitments at, at front level. You can see this commitment on, the, on my screen. And based on this commitment and the SDGs we have selected, we, we came up with these indicators. So now, so based on these 100 indicators, we, we choose some of them, which are representative uh, to our work. So again, we have these uh, core topics that are important for us, research efficiency. And um, these are indicators we measure at fund level. But obviously, I want to, 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 to indicate here that we, we face um, some challenges, because as, we, as you can see, most of them are process indicators and not um, uh, outcome indicators or result indicators. And I think here is uh, the way we need to improve our, of the, our uh, KPIs because for the investors of the, or the buyers of the production, production they're interested in the, in the impact indicators. But at the same time, to measure impact indicators, you need time. And sometimes we don't have the time. So, so it's a kind of a, a challenge we face. And um, I, I want to say that this KPI framework is still a work in progress. And I think it will be always a work in progress. We can always improve the way we measure um, our impact. Obviously, we need to keep with some of them because otherwise we cannot see the, the progress. Yeah, so in terms of prog measuring progress, I think here's a good way to show that. Uh, so we, for us and for the investors that do not know um, a lot about farming, so we, we decided to have kind of a scorecard 
uh, spider graph where we can see the progress. Um, so we, here in this graph, we have three different curves. Um, the first one is um, we measure the impact of the farm just after acquisition of the farm by one to three. Now the second curve is um, the situation right now. And, and the, th the third one is to, um, uh, to set targets, for, let's say in five years. So can we always uh, see the progress, um, how we manage a farm and where we are. And this is very important to our investors to really know where we are and where, where we want to go. So the last slide of my presentation, I just wanted to say that there are different approaches in terms of uh, measuring impact. Um, most of the of the of the in investors have like kind of a top-down um, um, uh, vision where, where they first um, set objectives of the fund, and and then they they um, based on these objectives uh, they have some uh, KPIs and these KPIs reflected some some SDGs that they select. Our vision is a bit different because we we had very intensive discussion with the project manager just after launching one to three about three years ago to choose the, the right indicators to measure the impact of our farm. So we first started from the project and then we came up with the indicators. So we have like the, the vision just from the farm and not bottom up. So it's, uh, it's bottom up, sorry, not, and not top down our kind of approach. What I wanted to say here is, um, kind of complicated because there are too many frameworks and methodology to evaluate impact. So I think there are plenty of different initiatives which, which are all great, but um, to me, it sometimes is, is too much and it's very difficult to, to compare a methodology between, because there are too much methodologies and, and, and the funds, each funds follow one methodology. So I think it's, it's very important to share knowledge in, in this sector, in, in the impact measurement sector. Uh, with um, with the different investors, Miro, Valfilia, and, and Moringa, and many others, to share ideas and and try to come up with a um, same uh, impact framework, so we can we can compare a project. Um, and I think this is one of the initiatives that UNEP is uh, the, the United Nations are currently working on this to um, kind of um, develop a common framework, so we can better. Um, measure impact. And yeah, to me, it's very important not to not only rely on the easy KPIs, uh, like number of tree planted, of job created, because this is, doesn't mean anything in terms of, of uh, uh, impact. So as you know, like we can have a um, thousand of, of, of jobs, but um, the, these jobs could be very bad paid and, and the con working condition could be very bad. So, so for me, it's very important to they came up with concrete um, KPIs, but strong KPI that really measure impact. Yeah, so my, my last slide is about like why we want to report and, 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 and to warm. So for us, we have kind of different stakeholders where we need to report. We have obviously our main investor, which is a pension fund, but we also work with other small family offices. And we also need to report to our buyers. So, so as I mentioned before, we have different crops. We, we, we have cardamom, we have cocoa, we have coffee, we have banana. So each, each buyer uh, wants uh, they want their own reporting. So it's kind of difficult for us to manage um, like multiple, a lot of re different reportings because it's also costly for the team. And as I mentioned before, we already involved in many different, um, we have many different processes where the sustainability is working on. So that's one challenge we, we face. And obviously for me, impact is, uh, to measure impact is um, you need time. And also to assess ESG risks at the beginning of the, the process or the investment process. I mentioned we, we do like a kind of a screening to, to, uh, to evaluate the social and environmental risk. But uh, we want to, as an asset manager, we, we need to invest quickly because obviously when we invest into a project, we receive a fee from, from, from our clients. So we need to invest and find quickly projects. But at the same time, it's important to take time to not avoid investing in, in, in bad projects and, and then face uh, different uh, challenges, social and mental challenges. So 
this kind of like a contradiction here to at the same time, we need to invest quickly uh, into projects, but at the same time, we need to take time to assess the risks and also measure impact because impact to measure impact, uh, you need time um, process indicators you can measure it every year, but in, in the impact indicators, you need to, more, to, to, to have more time to see the real change on the field. Um, what I want to also to say here is, um, I think it's very important to, to educate people and sustainability should not be like a one separate de department from the rest of the investment team. So we really need to work together and to have in mind the same uh, goals. And, um, and um, yeah, so my philosophy is not to see the, the sustainability department of a complete different department from, from the project manager or from the fund manager, but we really need to work together and find solution on the challenges. And um, here, I think it's education, a, a big, uh, a big topic. Also, in in the in the, in the farm management for us, we, as I said, we manage twelve different farms uh, with many different culture and teams, and it's very important to um, educate people to um, support regenerative agroforestry systems. Um, and not uh, kind of follow like, the green revolution um, um, uh, concepts of uh, using a lot of fertilizers and pesticides. Um, yeah, so, and maybe my last point is to really highlight what one, why we, we want to um, report, um, is it in terms of impact, we want to report to improve the work um, of the farms, um, how transparent is our reporting? Because we, we as a company, we, we I mentioned we, we work with some um, external auditors, but at the end we 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 don't have like um, um, someone that control the the information we publish. So I think it's a question we need to have to to have if we if we want to work with external auditors to uh, like uh, kind of evaluate the information is published. And also, why do we want to report? Is it to change the way we invest into projects? For example, see if we want to support more regenerative agroforestry farms, or if we want to continue investing in uh, monocultures. And maybe my last words, we have invested into different farms. Um, some of them are used to be like monocultures. We try to uh, put more trees in, in um, between the cocoa trees, but, um, yeah, we see the impact of climate change in these uh, monocrop uh, farming systems. Thank you. Fantastic, Lenny. Thank you so much for that perspective. As you touched upon uh, a few very uh, relevant points. So, you know, how you measure and how you can see the impact at the project level, uh, one, two, three, but also you touched upon a, a few challenges of the industry. So the multiplicity of, you know, impact, uh, methodologies, the timing consideration that also kind of connects with whether, you know, a fund, an investment fund is the actual, the best, um, you know, way of delivering this impact, um, given that you have these uh, kind of urgency to deploy capital and also kind of um, what should be the, the conversation at the, at the industry level to, uh, to be able to better compare the impact uh, from these projects. So we have now around five minutes for Q&A. We took a bit longer than what we expected. I see Ninke that you already addressed one of the questions of our participants, and thank you for that. Um, I'm going to um, let the, the speakers uh, see if they have any questions for each other while I encourage the rest of participants to, to, sub, to submit um, new questions. Great. Well, That's fine. So maybe while we, while we wait for participants to also share questions in the, in the Q&A, um, maybe interesting to hear from, uh, from Lenny. Um, how do you look at, I mean, if, of course you're, you're capitalized now eh, by, this, uh, by this pension fund, but if, for example, your capital would be doubled or tripled, um, what, what opportunity or what need do you see in the market for your type of, uh, of investment initiatives? Yeah, so we are currently working also with another um, 
uh, investor, which is not like a typical uh, pension fund, because we 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 will work work with a, a chocolate uh, f um, a chocolate company, and we we want to invest into more cocoa farms. Um, so we currently are looking for different projects. We all we do have some project in the pipeline uh, in in Guatemala and Colombia. So we yes, we always are looking for new projects. Um, to me, it's very important to support multi-crops uh, farms. Uh, so not only cocoa, uh, but also other like other crops, and also manage a more uh, a small farming program. Um, so yes, we 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 are always looking at new projects. Uh, right now, we are we will have like a new uh, mandate uh, from a chocolate um, company. And. Uh... And I think maybe one, one of the challenges that uh, that we run into as a technical assistance facility, so as, as a bit of a go-between, um, is that many of the initiatives on the ground are often not, not big enough to yeah, absorb or manage uh, the bigger type of capital that uh, that is being offered by organizations like yours or, uh, or, or LDN Fund or others. How, how do you look at that gap? So. I think one of yeah. one of the solutions that we're tentatively puzzling with is see well what type of local financing structures could you come up with to promote transition to agroforestry, regenerative agriculture at a smaller scale. How how would you look at that as Agri3? As as, uh, as one, two, three, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes <laughs> for, so I yes, forest it was quite so originally the mandate we received from the pension fund, it was like a forestry mandate. So we, we, we wanted to support uh, forestry uh, farms or plantations. We had quite some issues to find uh, a large scale um, native mixed uh, trees plantation because part of our commitment is to invest into uh, native trees plantation. At the same time, we need to invest at least five million per project. So we, have this, we, have, we cannot invest into very small projects. So for us, we had a big issue to uh, find like a large scale uh, plantation, which are native with natives planted with native trees. Um, so, so, so for the forestry project, we 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 have invested most of most of in 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 um, greenfield projects. So what we call greenfield, so not established plantation, because we we couldn't find any plantation that were like. With native trees plantation, and we cannot invest into eucalyptus plantation because it's not like allowed in our mandate to invest into this type of plantation. So yes, we 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 face kind of yeah, we we had some difficulties to to find forestry projects. Um, I would say uh, agroforestry project. We didn't have some. We 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 received a lot of uh, different projects uh, in Latin America. Um, so it was less an issue for this. Um, uh, type of projects. And at the same time, maybe to say like it's, uh, it's for us is kind of difficult because the native tree plantation are the, the, the species are not well known in the, on the international market. So not like teak and, and eucalyptus, there is a market um, with a price reference, but for the native tree species like um, Amarillo Zapatero, uh, it's difficult to, to sell them. So one of the solution we, we, we decided is to support um, uh, processing center so we can keep the value added on the, on the ground and uh, process the, the, the wood into in, in carpentry or sawmill to add value on, on of these uh, on trees. Interesting. Fantastic. So I, we've uh, reached, um, unfortunately, we had uh, many, I had personally uh, a few questions for you, and, and there was a, a question in the, in, in the chat box from another speaker, but we've reached the end of our session, so we'll have to, to leave that for the next time. Um, I, need, I, I, I need to thank, again, um, the speakers, uh, Lenny, Ninke, Boris, for you know, making yourself available for your effort in joining the conference, uh, and as well as thank the Intellicap team for making this possible. Um, we look forward to you know following your work, and we wish you the best in in your endeavors.
So speak soon. Thank you so much. Have a, a good rest of the day.